And welcome back to yet another episode, a scorching episode of Sports scorching. with a Z and a T. I'm Bryce Linsky alongside Tara Lattimore. I'm sweating my ass off with a, a nice, if you're if you're watching our stream, I even cracked open a Corona for this one. It's that hot up here. And Taylor, I know you agree. So mm -hmm. um, thank you for joining us. Once again, we are presented by Godzilla Media, sponsored by Mohawk Honda, Saving Face Barbershop, and more to come on that down the line. Very excited news coming out in July. Um, that's a nice little tease for next week's episode. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a lot to get to once again. The NBA Conference Finals are underway, uh, almost over in the Western Conference, maybe. We'll see about that. And then um, well underway in the Eastern Conference as well. We have our first impressions on the MLB foreign substance rule policy, which got a little interesting. Uh, we have some Yankees talk that we're going to get to. And not that we're such a New York uh, centralized podcast when it comes to sports talk, but feel like the Yankees are so – it's just such a bizarre conversation that you don't normally have with the Yankees. we got to touch on it. Um, we're going to touch on uh, a, a list that neither of us agree with when it comes <laughs> to football. And then, obviously, it's America Week, so we'll, we'll get to some, some Independence Day uh, top favorites when it comes to celebrating the 4th of July, and then we'll head on out of here. I'm going to try once again our weekly. I will try to keep it under 45 minutes. I we'll cannot, see. I cannot promise you anything. Uh, we'll you know, see. that's the, you know, the kiss of death. It, it'll be another hour and 10 minutes. You know, it will be, but let's, it'll let's be two have, hours this time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, God, I hope not. Uh, <laughs> Just keep uh, getting longer and longer as we promise. It'll be short. I, I'm going to need more than one Corona. Okay. Uh, but let's, <laughs> Let's head right to the NBA Conference Finals, Taylor. Um, you know, we talked last week heading in. None of the games really were played yet. Uh, talking about how it's going to be wide open. We didn't really know what to expect because this is four teams that, you know, they all have their issues to some degree um, with injuries and, and, you know, inconsistencies and not really know who the favorite's going to be. It appeared to be that the Suns, let's start in the Western Conference, it appeared to be that the Suns were going to run away with the series. Clippers have come roaring back. They are now only down 3-2. to two. Um, Look, the Suns have waited 28 years since their last NBA Finals berth. They're on the cusp again. Um, Devin Booker has been incredible. CP3, for the most part, since he's been back, has been good. Um the Suns appear to be their deeper team with the Clippers not having Kawhi yet in the series. Maybe he makes an appearance in game six to be determined. Um, but has anything the Clippers given us, even though they have roared back, look, they've been down to nothing three times, right? And mm -hmm. they're trying to be, not only have they been the first NBA team to come back twice from being 2-0 down, they're trying to do it a third time to make an appearance to the NBA finals. But have we seen anything from the Clippers to convince us otherwise that the Suns will not be, by the time we have our next episode, the Suns will not be the Western Conference champs? Um, no, not really. Right. Um, I mean, if if Kawhi were to play in game six, um, then they have a chance. And I, I'm not saying that they don't have a chance to force a game seven, obviously. I think at this point you can't really count the Clippers out because they've done it down 2-0, down 2-0 again. Now down three one or two, they were down two zero and then three one and now three two. Obviously, they're they're trying to claw their way back in, but at some point, you think that their their luck has to run out because I mean, Paul George, Paul George seems to be trying to be that guy, you know, like the 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 franchise guy um, that he people used to think that he was before he was kind of relegated to being like a number two uh, type guy. But I mean, last night forty one points. I mean you can't beat that. Like that was probably his best game ever in, in the playoffs. Um, and so, you know, you can't count him out entirely. Um, but you know, this Suns team is good and you'd think that they will close it out. If not tomorrow, then, you know, in a game seven, you'd think that they would barring Kawhi coming back, Kawhi coming back changes everything for me because the Clippers have been playing. The Clippers have been playing fantastic sans Kawhi. Like without Kawhi, they've still been like a a like they're a they're they're a hard out no matter what. They're a hard out. They play hard. They're well coached, very well coached. Actually, Tyloo is 
surprised me with how well that he's coached this team. Um, and Paul George just doesn't quit. And you got like guys like Pat Bev who have that, that dog in them. Um, and they're getting after it. Uh, Pat Bev, I got to give him props because a lot of people um, kind of downplaying his defensive like prowess. But I mean, he's, he's putting it up. He's, he's making Devin Booker and Chris Paul very uncomfortable. And I think it's the key to part of how they're, they're, at least defensively, keeping up with them. I, I love the mock Pat Bev did of CP3 when I CP3 kind of leaned into it a I little bit, and too. he did. CP3 leaned into it, and yeah, I, it, I, I, that was not dirty in any way. I thought that he was trying to work over that screen, and Chris Paul was trying to draw the foul, and he did. And I don't think that and, anything that Pep did was dirty, and I think and, that and it was exaggerated. And we've talked about this on this show probably for three weeks now we talk about that rule that they're going to try to implement over the summer that's just another reason i had no problem with what pat bev did and look it's just it's just the game it's just the game right now and yeah and that's what's frustrating and he leaned into it cp3 sold it and, and got the call that's today's nba but what to your point about how hard the clippers are playing even without Kawhi, they are they're going to be a hard out and they're they're showing why a lot of people, including myself, picked the Clippers to be the Western Conference champs because I they are, when they're playing at their best, very, very good. Now, did I expect Kawhi to be out? No, I, I didn't expect that. But, you know, Paul George netting a playoff best 41 points kind of silenced the critics, at least for a night. But the bottom is, it's just one game. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, the Suns have been the better team throughout this series, as evidenced by their three two lead well the thing is all the games have been fairly close like the suns haven't blown them out it's not like when they played the lakers or the nuggets where they were like kind of blowing them out at times where it was i mean the lakers obviously they were the shell themselves but it was laughable at times they were up by 30 like you know just putting it to them and these games these games all been close you go back to i think it was what game two or three where Paul George misses the two free throws yeah, yeah. in clutch time. And that's ended up with the, the alley-oop to DeAndre Ayton uh, wins the game. That but, was game two. That yeah, was, that was, but, stun- how, that was how incredible. I, I mean, it was, but at the same time, there's only one play. You know what's yeah. coming, and you still couldn't defend it. That was poor execution on the Clippers' part, but great execution. Look, I, I mean, give credit where credit's due on the Suns, but I, I think that was just more on the Clippers. Well, like, that. Well, I point had eight, issue with it. Point eight is like is right on the cusp where you can kind of you could catch and shoot at point eight seconds left. It's an uncomfortable catch and shoot it. Like it it's like it's you still do it. Whereas if it's point like point like three, then it has to be like a tip in. Um, but you're right. I mean, they should have definitely known that that was definitely a possibility that could have happened. But it was also a fantastic, pa- a perfect pass and a perfect finish by. D- I'm more impressed by the pass, honestly. J- Drake Carter laid that up in the perfect spot where like Aiden didn't have to do much. He just had to be there. But I mean, what I'm saying is like that, that, that game was close. That game could have gone either way. And then the, the game three, um, I think it was game three or game four, where it was like 84 to 80, which is super low scoring game. And that game was extremely close too. like, it could have gone either way. So even the games that the Clippers are losing, it's not like they're getting blown out at all. They're very much in these games down to the wire. And I think we expected this to be a good series. And I think a lot of people were also surprised when Phoenix jumped out to that two, nothing lead right off the rip, even though they were home, this just felt like a series that's going to go at least six or seven. So it's only right that we are going six or seven. I will say this, if this does go seven, even though it's in Phoenix, I'm going to take the Clippers because all the momentum has been sort of shifting towards the Clippers way. And I feel like if there is a game seven, you're going to see Kawhi. If you don't see him in game six, but the Clippers yet survive and push it to game seven, you're going to see Kawhi in game seven. And and I just feel like that's going to be enough to push them over the top, though. I do think the Suns. I'm going to do the cop out answer. I think the Suns are going to win Mm -hmm. game six, but if they don't, I'm I'm going to kind of hedge bet myself. If they don't, yeah. I like the Clippers in seven. Yeah, I, I mean, like I just said, like the fact that it's so close without Kawhi, if Kawhi were to come back, then I would think, I mean, if you're scaling it right now, the Clippers and Suns seem pretty close, honestly. Like they seem pretty close skill-wise and execution-wise and coaching-wise. Ty Lue, I think, is 
a much better coach than I thought he was heading into this playoff series. I mean, he had he has a great record in um, you know elimination games. He's ten and two now, but a lot of that was with LeBron. So I kind of you know took it for granted, just saying like, ah, well, I mean, LeBron is great in elimination games, so I didn't think it was all Ty Lue. But he's really turned it around for me, and I think he's he's one of the better coaches in the NBA. But I think they're more or less an evenly matched team, and I think the Suns are a bit better without Kawhi. If Kawhi were to come back, whole different story. I think at that point, it it would. I think everyone would have to favor the Clippers. I mean, the Suns are great, but the Clippers have been so good without Kawhi. If you add him back in there, then it just changes the game completely. But my problem is, I we don't even know like what's going on with Kawhi. Really, I feel like there has been a, a distinct lack of transparency. The, like he has, we an thought ACL. it was a East- something you know it comes out as a knee sprain then it comes out that it's an achilles injury but we won't say what the achilles injury is yeah it, it's it. very suspect but then you see video of him in you know in the hallway leading out to the court like near the tunnel and he's not even wearing a brace so you don't really know what's going on and yeah. i'm sure if Kawhi, you know Kawhi's trying to do everything he can to play i know he was a big front runner face of the load management controversy back you know mm-hmm. when this all started to surface so who knows but i feel like when we come playoff time Kawhi's going to be trying to get out there so it's definitely going to be interesting to see what really comes out of that um I mean, look, if it's an Achilles injury, you don't want to do a repeat of what happened to KD in the finals. You don't you don't want that. So I I think it's going to be one of those things. If it is that serious, you're not going to see Kawhi. But I feel like if it was that serious, you'd see a little more limitation of him when you do see him in public. Uh, or at least they'd say that like he's probably not going to play this out series. for the season. They're, like he's been going game to game. He's yeah, been they, questionable at a lot of these games. He's listed as questionable, he's, and then they pretty much a like game time decision. It feels like or like Correct. game to game or day to day. Yeah, I should say where like every day, like the day before, we get a, a, an update, or the day of, we get an update. And it's like ah, oh, he's not playing. I don't think we've gotten an update for game six yet. But no, like if he, if he doesn't play, we'll probably get it today or tomorrow. Um, and they'll just be like, Hey, he's not playing or he's going to play. I really hope he does. Cause I want to see what this team can do, uh, with him. And I think that they could, they could crawl back into the series, but also coming back from down two Oh twice and then coming back from down two Oh and then three one is would just be like an incredible playoff run for sure this would. team. Sure and would. at that point, I think it would, I don't even know how much gas they would have left for the finals. If, if they were to even get there. Well, let's talk about if they do get there, who they'd be playing, and that would be the winner of the Bucks and the Hawks series. That series is a little farther behind the the Western Conference, so it's two to one right now. And, and Atlanta came out scorching hot, took that one nothing lead, and I was like, okay, maybe they're looking to crash some more parties. They crashed, you know, the next party, which a lot of you know people didn't think would happen. Then they crashed my Sixers party, which I'm still hurting over (laughs) and not many people expect it to happen. And then they crashed the Bucks party right off the bat in convincing fashion, honestly, game one. And then the Bucks storm back and and take the next two games. And, you know, we, we are recording on Tuesday night. Game four is Tuesday night. So we're not going to really talk about the immediate game. We're going to talk about more of the future of this series, um, Giannis is, you know, playing better. He's better at the free throw line. Chris Middleton has become more of that closer, that closer role and has really done well. Don't forget about Drew Holiday, who has been playing much better since game one, who really got exposed in game one, but has been better. Um, now the Hawks, you know, Trey Young's going to play. I, I it's not that big of an issue, but it's an issue nonetheless rolled his ankle in game three. So he's dealing with the bum ankle. I guess my point on this is, is the adrenaline, is the energy finally hitting that E on the Hawks? And they're finally just they're They face so much good talent. They got, they were in a battle with the Sixers. Now they're facing the Bucks, who just wore down the Nets. Definitely are the more talented team, deeper team, in my opinion. I mean, the Hawks are good. Don't get me wrong. They're not in the Eastern Conference Finals for no reason. 
but I think the Bucks are finally wearing them down defensively and, and just physically. Obviously, with Middleton and Giannis and the way Drew Holiday plays defense, you have Tucker on the defensive end as well. I, I think this Bucks team is just finally mm. getting to this Hawks team and wearing them down to the point that I don't know if they have enough left for another seven game run. Yeah, it seems like this Bucks uh, team is kind of hitting their stride, I would say. Um, game one was kind of, um, I think, you know, Bucks coming off. Not that the Hawks didn't have a grueling seven game series, but I think it's different when you're playing like this, the Nets over, sorry, your Sixers. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was only a three point win in game one, 116, 113. So it was closer than, um, than it would seem just by looking at that, say that they won, um, game one in, in convincing fashion. It was convincing by, you know, three points they got there. And then the Bucks came back in game two and smacked them and won by almost 30. So I think the Bucks kind of flex their muscles there. And then um, game three, it was, you know, Atlanta took the early lead and then the Bucks stormed back. They had a huge fourth quarter. Chris Middleton had like 20 points in the fourth quarter. And I think the Bucks are falling into their groove where they have Giannis. They try to get him out in transition, try to get those easy buckets. That's where he's best is when he can take literally three steps from the half court line to the basket and throw it down and, you know, isolating him kind of on the low post. And then you have Middleton who can just get a shot from anywhere, especially when he's hot, he can just pull up from literally anywhere and he can score with the best of them. And I think that that, that one, two punch is working for them along with drew holiday's defense. Drew holiday actually isn't doing great offensively. I mean, at last still averaging game, he, 20 points the last game. He was two for 11 with six points, but he had 12 assists. So he's, he's doing his part where he can. And obviously he's, he's hounding um, as much as they can on defense and the Hawks, the Hawks rely a lot on Trey young, obviously. And if Trey young is at all hampered by his apparent angle and in, ankle injury, uh, that he sustained in game three, then yeah, the Hawks, the Hawks are going to be in trouble. And it honestly, it could go seven, but I'd see it going more like six and the bucks just kind of roll from here on out. The, uh, the Milwaukee's big three, which is Giannis Middleton and drew holiday. Um, Giannis is averaging 30 Middleton's averaging 22 and holiday is averaging 20. So they're getting production out of all three. Like you said, they're hitting their stride at the right time. And Trey Young is the head of the stake for the Hawks. And if he's yes. bothered by this knee and he wasn't good after the knee injury, it, it came out that it's a bone bruise. Like I said, he's questionable for game four. We're not Those are painful. Go. Yeah. Trust me. I've, I've had one. It's not yeah, me too. It's not good. It, um, look, it, it's you, he's going to play, but to ask him to be effective is going to be another thing. And when he's the head of the snake, like I said, you're going to need production elsewhere. Bogdanovich has been bothered by a knee himself that went mm -hmm. that leads back to the Sixers series, and he's only really averaging 12, 12 points a game in the playoffs. So they're not really getting the production all the way back from Bogdanovich, mm -hmm. and, and he was not good either in, in game three. Not yeah. to harp on the pass, but he was three of 16. So clearly mm -hmm. he's not 100%. Um, Herder's been inconsistent, which you expect from a young player. Um, Lou Williams will need to play a bigger role. It, this team is going to miss DeAndre Hunter in this series. And I thought they were going to definitely miss him in the Sixers series, but mm -hmm. clearly they, they are lacking that depth, especially when it comes to one of their better defensive players to stop the big three. And I just think back to my point that the Bucks are wearing them down. Uh, the tank is close to E at this point on the Hawks, and I think it's only inevitable. If this does go to six or seven, I still like the Bucks. However, I'm thinking it's over for the Hawks. I'm taking Bucks. Now, I could look really stupid once again, and I've doubted the Hawks before. They were down two to one. Sixers were up two to one against the <laughs> Hawks, too. So mm -hmm. I could easily be wrong on this, but I'm thinking, but, and I said, I said Sixers in five, I'm saying bucks in five too. <laughs> I think the Hawks, depending on Trey Young's health, may be able to get one more game. The reason I say that is Trey Young's health. The reason yeah. I'm saying bucks in five is if Trey Young well, is not healthy, like if I said, he healthy, now, you'd probably say seven, right? Now, like yeah, at least a seven game series. Correct. You and I, like we said, know what a 
bone bruise feels like, especially in the knee. It's not great. Um, now he has better trainers and doctors than we would ever see. So he, he will be ready. However, once he gets out on the court and the physical style that the Bucks play, excuse me, I don't see it. I, I really, I really don't see where the Hawks have enough physically to compete with the Bucks at this point in the playoffs. Well, you know, with a bone bruise, I feel like a lot of it's um, it's controlling the inflammation that might come with it, which hampers your your range of motion and whatnot. And then on top of that, just dealing with the overall pain of it, and that's pain management, and that's that's down, you know, player to player who can tolerate more pain. Um, if Trey Young is he seems like a tough guy. So I think he can play through a lot of pain, but that pain might affect his jump shot, which is, you know, a lot of what he, he relies on that and his explosiveness. And the problem with the Hawks overall, especially if Trey is injured is that they rely on him for so much. Not only is he the guy who scores the most, he's also the guy who sets up the most. He is the playmaker. He is the guy who breaks down the defense. And then when they collapse on him, he finds the open guy, lobs it up to Capella or whoever, John Collins, and all that revolves around him. It's not like, you know, the Clippers where Kawhi is obviously their best player by far, but he is out and they can still rely on guys like Paul George and Reggie Jackson and even Marcus Morris last night to just go off. And the Hawks don't really have those guys that, can really create off the dribble by themselves except for guys like Bogdanovich. But you said like, he's like you said, he's hampered and um, hurt her, but he's a young player who's, who's, you know, inconsistent. So I think they rely a lot on Trey young. And if Trey young is not 100% and if he's not even 90%, then it's going to be hard for them. But I still think, you know, Trey Young's not out. He just, he just a little banged up. So I think that they could probably get one more game if they have a good shooting night. They can get one more game on them. But that's why I, I think it'll go six. I don't think it'll go seven. I think the Bucks will impose their will and try to end this game as quick or the series as quickly as possible. We all know the NBA. And when there's four teams in the NBA that nobody really considered to be the top dogs, nobody really considered to be there in the finals, you know there's going to be news elsewhere. You know there's going to be news surrounding superstars. Well, there's news around some superstars right now. And that is between one Damian Lillard of the Portland Trail Blazers and one Ben Simmons of the Philadelphia Sixers. Now, you could consider Ben Simmons a superstar. I'm ready to blast that to the moon, but that <laughs> I'm going to stay on topic here. There's a lot of backlash with the Portland Trailblazers right now when it comes to the process of how they hired their new coach, which Chauncey Billups, great hire, but however, it's controversy around how they handled the whole situation. Um, there's concerns on whether a championship contender can be put together out in Portland. And that's becoming some factors of Damian Lillard maybe losing his patience with the Portland Trailblazers. And, and there's now a lot of talk that he's – might be pushing the franchise to trade him, which for a lot of Portland fans out there, that's going to be hard to stomach because he mm -hmm. is the definition of loyalty. And he gave Portland every opportunity to put something together. Um, like I said, remain loyal to Portland in large part due to that, due to that fan base over the last few days. Some of the fans have turned on him on social media. He's been chirping back on social media. They brought in Chauncey Billups as the new head coach. Um, the thing about it is before the coaching search happened, Neil Olshey, who's the team's president of basketball operations out in Portland, said that he would include Damian Lillard in that process. Mm -hmm. All she headed the coaching search, but none of the candidates were interviewed or suggestions from Dame. From Dame. Dame ended up having no say, even after the franchise said he'll have a say. So obviously that's going to rub the all NBA, all NBA guard the wrong way. Um, 
Which leaves us to, there's a lot of talk about Lillard talking to other players throughout the NBA, feeling out where he might want to go. It just so happens that as this report came out, that Dame Lillard wants out of Portland or potentially could want out of Portland, that the Philadelphia 76ers are at the top of the list if he were to ask for a trade. The Sixers are NBA title ready. I'm going to say that. They are NBA title ready. Mm -hmm. And they should have been NBA title ready this year. They were NBA title ready this year. Mm -hmm. However, circumstances have changed. And the Sixers might just happen to have their own superstar player that they're looking to trade in Ben Superstar. <coughs> superstar. Air quotes, air quotes, air quotes. quotes superstar. In my opinion. <clears throat> to me, superstars don't shy away from dunks in game seven of a playoff series, but <clears throat> we'll not talk about that. Um, <laughs> bottom line is Ben Simmons could use a fresh start. Now, all the reports coming out from Ben Simmons' campus, he's not playing in the Olympics this year for Team Australia. He's going to work on bettering himself, and <laughs> he is going to be working in the gym. Individual I don't know where this was. Development. Individual also, again, development. Air quotes, uh, air quotes, yeah. air quotes. Individual development, as uh, the Shams pointed out today. Um, not really sure what that means, and I'm not really sure – Learning uh, how to shoot, maybe. Where hopefully. individual development has been the past four years. I don't know what makes <laughs> year five different. But anywho, bottom line is Ben Simmons could use a new change of scenery. The Sixers have a Ben Simmons problem. And you can sit there and look. Since we aired, Daryl Morey has come out and gone to bat. Doc Rivers has gone to bat for Ben Simmons saying they're going to fix it. Ben, They want Ben Simmons to be part of the process literally and figuratively, and not part of the problem here in Philadelphia. You could believe what you want from Daryl and Doc, but swapping Simmons for Lillard straight up won't cut it, but it's a great starting point and logical for all sides. To me, and we'll talk about potential destinations for Dame outside of Philadelphia as well, because there's obviously going to be more than just Philly. Mm -hmm. But to me, and this is not even contested, Considering my bias to Philly, <laughs> Dane makes the most sense to go to Philadelphia. The Sixers need a point guard who isn't afraid to shoot in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Lillard checks box there. Uh, the, Blair, the Blazers need a point guard to replace theirs. I guess you could check that box for Ben. Um, as long as Dame is cool with moving, mm -hmm. you get a point guard to team up with Joel Embiid. You send Tyrese Maxey and or Matisse Tybel along with Ben, plus throw in, you know, some first rounders in 2024, 2027, whatever, whatever you want, whatever picks you want, Portland, take what you want. Mm -hmm. 2022, obviously. And you send that to Portland for Damian Lillard. The Sixers are in win now mode. As much as I yeah. like Tyrese Maxey, I don't care about five years from now. I need Joel Embiid to win a championship. I need this core to win a championship. And I don't think it's going to be with Ben Simmons. I care more about what Joel Embiid needs than what Ben Simmons needs. I need what's going to cater Tobias Harris. It's not going to be Ben Simmons. Look, is Ben Simmons a lead on the defensive end of the floor? Sure. Is he a lead at distributing the ball? Sure. But I need a guy that I can trust outside of Tobias Harris and Joel Embiid that can close a game out. If that's not Damian Lillard, I don't know what is a closer. Damian Lillard is as good of a closer as you could get in the NBA, and it would be a perfect marriage and a perfect pairing with Joel Embiid. I would sell the farm. <clears throat> and honestly, in my opinion, there's one untouch Taylor, there's one untouchable for me if I'm the Sixers this offseason. And that's Joel, Joel Embiid. Embiid. <laughs> Figure it out. Pair Damian Lillard with Joel Embiid. And watch them have a day. Now, ideally, I don't think Tobias Harris is shoppable. I don't yeah. see Tobias Harris being in, in a part of any conversation. But if you're saying Ben Simmons, Tybal, and Maxi and a couple picks for the best, in my opinion, a top two point guard in the NBA to pair with Joel Embiid, yeah, sign me up and make the Sixers the favorites in the Eastern Conference next year. Yeah. So we'll, we'll let's go back 
it, the first that we heard of the the whole i mean there's always been rumors there's rumors about every star um especially after they, they it's been the building playoff. up for a while now but, with dame in but portland it, but this is from chris haynes and in a, a, a lot of what i've been hearing is that chris haynes is he's he's a real like players guy so if the player if he's talking and saying something then that's probably coming directly from the player or the player's camp and this, this is the tweet from chris haynes the backlash from portland trailblazers coaching search and his concern over whether a championship contender can be built have become major factors that could force damien Lillard to request out league sources tell yahoo sports and chris haynes um i will preface that by saying that uh windhorst um put out a thing today that said that Damian Lillard might not request the trade out, but I, I think don't trust I, Brian yeah, Windhorst with anything. I, I trust Chris Haynes more he's a than bum. I trust he's Brian. He's a LeBron Windhorst. lover who but, knows nothing. But, but That's just my um, I agree with most of what you said. I think Dame, obviously, if he went to Philly, Philly would be one of the places where it would just make sense because Philly needs someone who can score, someone who's not going to take no shots in the fourth quarter, someone who's going to score like crazy in the fourth quarter, and that's Dame. Dame hits clutch shots like it's his job, and he is one of the most clutch uh, players in the NBA, and he's obviously like, he's like night and day, like, him and Ben Simmons on the offensive side. Obviously, the defensive side, Ben Simmons has got him. But this is an Lillard's offensive not lead. a liability, though, defensively. No, it's not no, like he's talking fine. about a liability. He's not someone who's going to get, like, searched out and, like, targeted, usually. Right. He can hold his own, um, especially when you have – I mean, if you build your defense, having that back line of, you know, Joel Embiid, one of the best interior defenders you could possibly have. So I, I, I'm not worried about – well. I don't know about that, but <laughs> I, I'm sorry. But, I had to throw it out there. I'm sorry. But, 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 um, no, yeah, it, it's, it's a perfect pairing on that side. The problem is I would say the Portland side. Now, if he requests out, like if he really requests it and demands a trade out, that changes things because that hamstrings Portland, just like it did Houston when James Harden requested out and he ended up going exactly where he wanted to go. Anthony Davis went exactly where he wanted to go. So the, the team really doesn't have as much power as people would like to believe, especially when their star player player chooses to demand. Yeah. The player power in the NBA and they have like almost ultimate power. And like if they demand a trade, they usually go exactly where they want to go. The, only difference would be like Kawhi who got sent to the Raptors for one year, but um, dude won a championship. So can he really complain? But I digress. I don't know if Portland would want Ben because if you look at it, oh, this they'll way, take him. They'll take him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if they have to, but if, if, if I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm getting rid of Dame who shoots and scores and does all this for Ben who can only distribute to the guys that you already don't trust to shoot, which is why Damian Lillard takes all the shots and does all the scoring. It would be a great backstep for Portland, obviously, but at least they would get an all-star guy who can you still have a shooter and, in McCollum. Yeah, but McCollum was so streaky this last year, especially in the playoffs. That's wow. why they're talking about getting rid of him to maybe keep Dame, get rid of CJ, bring someone else in. So, I don't think it makes sense for that their side, but if they were going to get picks, I guess it would be type of a like a rebuild type of thing where you kind of build from the ground up and you make Ben be your point guard. But I I would try to move him, you know, to to power forward or even center and be like a small ball like Jokic type, you know. Well, point yeah, no, center he, he would have to be a power forward or, or or a small ball center. He you you can't ask him to be more of a point guard. But I mean, if the Sixers have the opportunity to get out of that four you know, four year, 33 mil per year deal mm-hmm. to acquire a four year, 39 deal for, for Dame. And look, losing Maxi and Tybal would hurt, but <clears throat> you're still, I mean, it's almost worth biting the bullet to see the combo of Lillard and Embiid and, and see what you can maximize out of Embiid with a shooting guard, you know, not, mm-hmm. and you're not losing Seth. You might bring Danny Green back. So the Sixers still have that core. Losing Maxi, I, I think he's very promising. But to my point, the Sixers aren't the Sixers aren't in the well, what is he gonna be in five years point? There you're in win now. Joel Embiid's 28, tw- almost 29 years old. 
it's mm-hmm. time to win with the process. Like mm-hmm. it's time for the process to come full circle. And would I have loved for that to be with Ben Simmons? Absolutely. But I just think he needs a fresh start. He cannot stay in Philadelphia. The first time he second guesses himself in the paint, the first time he passes up a shot, Philadelphia will eat him alive. He does not need that anymore. He is a good player. I like Ben Simmons as a player outside of his shooting. He needs a fresh start. Philly needs to move on as well. It, it just makes sense to me. I, 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 I would look to see Portland welcoming an opportunity to get a guy like Ben Simmons to kind of, and maybe that's what Ben needs a smaller market like Portland. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, he, the problem with the, the whole going back to what you said about how the, the reports are, he's not playing for team Australia because he's going to work on his individual development, whatever that means. But, the thing is, I feel like we hear this every year where it's like, we do oh, this ben- every year. <laughs> yeah, it's, exactly. It's like, uh, oh, hi, Otis. Um, <laughs> Otis decided to make an appearance today. It's it's the like, here we go again. And, and, it, and we're just like seeing if he can build a shot. He's had so many years where he could build a shot and and then you get those videos every off season where he's just in the practice gym nailing shot after shot oh he hits four five six seven threes in a row and it's like yeah that's cool but can he do it in a game can he do it in a game seven and he, and he hasn't he passed no. up a wide open dunk it makes no he's not even no taking sense. any shots much less no like uh he just needs to learn that like the world isn't gonna... he needs to learn how to play freaking basketball. Well, the world isn't going to come crashing down if you miss a shot. And I think most fans would rather you miss a shot than just not take them at all because we... it doesn't. It looks like you're not trying. We live through Markel Fultz and his yips. I, I want to <laughs> see Ben. I want to see Ben shoot a damn basketball. I, I, it's so infuriating. Um, Damian Lillard. It's going to be interesting to see how this. Uh, as Otis takes out my mic. <laughs> It's going to be interesting to see how this story unfolds because I have a hard time believing at this point Dane wants to stay in Portland if he knows they're not going to contend. I think at this point in his career, he wants to win a reign as well. I don't see any other opportunities really outside of Philly that are more enticing. You know, you could throw out the Knicks. The Knicks have been a spot, but I think the Knicks are still years away. You saw some good things. You threw out Boston, but that's going to require probably Jalen Brown at minimum. I'm not so sure Boston wants they they want to more maximize Tatum and Brown. They don't want to, you know, get rid of one of them yet. So I, I'd be hard pressed to see that being realistic. Um, somebody threw out Lillard to Miami to pair with Butler and Bam. That would be very nice. <laughs> that would be that would be nice, but it would also require the Heat now. Obviously, you know things change over time, but they were unwilling to part ways with Tyler hero. Okay, he listen, would be I would well, be obviously, so down yes. to get rid of Tyler hero for, for Damian Lillard at this I, point. No, yes. There's no comparison. I've heard, also heard the Mavericks, but I don't know. I mean, Kristaps is seems like your best, the option you want to get rid of, but I don't know if Portland, I mean, what do you think Portland would be more interested in Kristaps Porzingis or Ben Simmons? Ben Simmons. I don't. Really? I have zero. I have zero interest in what Christoph Porzingis brings to the table. Zero. Like but I, I think I, when before his injury, Christoph Porzingis was like he, he was really good, and he he could score and he could defend at least a little bit on the inside. He Obviously, didn't have a no good year. To defend him, but well, he struggled he, he to stay on the court. He so struggled to Simmons. stay on the court. Well, well Ben Simmons was good during the, the regular court. season. Ben yeah. played, but Ben played. Yes. And he's True. more co- and I think he's more coachable than Porzingis. I think Porzingis brings an ego that I don't think would be too welcomed in Portland. That's just me. Um, there's rumblings, obviously, that like you said, KP's frustrated with his role in Dallas. So mm-hmm. I mean, it would make. I, I mean, if you pair Lillard with Luca, Luca watch out. But the um, only problem I would see is that uh, Luke Luca kind of dominates. Obviously, he dominates the ball, and so does Dame. So, uh, but. Uh, of course, we've been through this story before where we're like CP3 sure and have. James Harden won't work because they both dominate the ball and they almost took down the 2017 full strength Warriors. So, I mean, 
you know, that is what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I think if he, the thing is, it doesn't really matter where Portland wants him to go. If he demands a trade, like I said, he almost, the, the player almost always gets what they want. And so if he were to be like, I want to play for the Mavs with Luca, I'm sure that Dallas would find a way. Dallas would throw as many picks as they have to to pair those two together because that's a basis for a great championship team. I mean, Luca and Dame is absurd. That would be absurd. Like the offense in that team would be ridiculous. I don't even care who you pair around them. They'll find someone. Yeah. It, I'm um, hoping, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that Daryl Morey of the Philadelphia 76ers realizes that to win a championship, you need a better guard to pair with your franchise center and Joel Embiid. That's so I'm hoping that, you know, Doc and Daryl don't fall in love with the fact that Ben Simmons is bringing in veteran coaches and, and not in a skipping team Australia at the freaking Olympics to work on a shot for the fifth consecutive off season. And we're going to see all these videos of him draining threes in a high school gym because there's no yeah. pressure on him. But God forbid we try to th- try that in a game. Like, I'm over it. Look, no, I, I, really. I I went through it for four years. I defended Ben Simmons to a T. I'm done. I'm done watching and defending nothing. He does nothing <laughs> on the offensive end of the floor. All he does yeah. is pass out. So I'm yeah. I'm over I, it. Brain in Dame. Trust the I've process. Thought about the best fit for Ben Simmons a lot this past week or two, especially when all these trades were popping up and it was obvious that the Sixers were going to at least entertain the idea. Yeah. Yeah. And the one team that comes to mind for me as the best fit for Ben is the golden state warriors, because I think, I think he could be basically like green 2.0. I was going to say you have Draymond. So yeah, obviously uh, either you'd relegate Draymond to the bench which is, you know, if he could take that. I mean, he's a team guy, so maybe he'd Shit, do it. Ben Simmons might be relegated to the bench before we know or, it, too. <laughs> or, you, or you trade Draymond in that, that package or whatever no, when, when you no, do it. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. And no, I'm not saying it to no, you. No. Three team trades exist, Bryce. Yeah, I know they do. He's you. not coming to Philly. Christ. No, I'm Taylor, not saying you should go to Philly. I'm don't. not saying that. I'm saying don't that bury me more than I already am, please. It would be Wiggins or not that you really want. Oh, Jesus, but- I don't want Wiggins either, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> Wiggins or Weissman, although Weissman obviously no, is the center, so you wouldn't want to play I, him. I, I have Embiid. I have the best All center in the All I'm saying <laughs> for Ben Simmons, I think that no, that is the sense. best place. It makes sense. Because, because he could be the defensive guy who also passes. The only thing that's different between him and Draymond Green is that Draymond isn't afraid to take a three if he's wide open. But usually he says he says in, he said in an interview uh, I think he was on the shop or, or something a couple of days ago he was like why am I gonna take the three when I could get you know Steph Curry a wide open shot and I think if Ben took that approach then yeah he could do the, wonders well that's nice for Draymond to say because he plays for the Warriors and plays with Steph Earth to no, him the Sixers don't the Sixers have a Curry and he's effective no. but we don't have a Steph Curry. Well, he wasn't saying about him. He was saying about himself when people know, were criticizing I, Draymond. No, but, I know, but it, but you can't apply that to Ben because you don't have you know an automatic lights out no, shooter like you could have. You could if Ben was on the Warriors, and that's why I think that's the best fit for Ben. That's personally my opinion. I don't know how the Sixers would get him there, or who would get him there. I don't know what, what we get back if Steph or Clay. Third team, you'd have to get a third team probably because I don't think Wiggins. Are you is giving enough. us Clay? Because no, that's no. Yeah, exactly no, obviously so. you have to take Steph and Clay, and it would be yeah. That's, Steve, that's but, not that's a no for me, dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the Sixers. I'm talking about for Ben Simmons. I'm caring about Ben. And Simmons I don't care about Ben Simmons anymore. <laughs> I know you don't. That's why I got to look out for him. Okay. <laughs> 
Eh, you're about the only one. Even Kendall Jenner left them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> For Devin Booker, who's <laughs> flying high now. But, yeah. Well, the Kendall Jenner curse is gone throughout the NBA. Like everybody's game goes to shit after she leaves them. So <laughs> watch out, Suns fans. You might want to sell high on Devin Booker. <laughs> hey, well, maybe if he wins a nice ring, he can put a ring on her and, and it'll be yeah, all over. A ring but- on Kendall Jenner that's not, you know, no, that remind, I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> We'll see. It's going to be an interesting offseason, but like to my point, you know, the conference finals are going on and here we are talking about the offseason. That's just that's the NBA and it's going to be fun to watch. Uh, the Olympics are coming up. So a lot of things going on in the basketball basketball world. Uh, we know Ben Simmons won't be in the Olympics, so we got that going for us. But it is summertime. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm on a roll today. <laughs> You're just crapping on Ben like. Uh, I have every right to. No, you do. You do. You do. <laughs> so I'm hot. It's summertime, so it's hot everywhere. So that that's trade-in season, right, for your cars. You've traded in your vehicle. Now what? Every dealer wants your trade-in right now. I'm sure you've all gotten emails or calls, you know, cold calls about trading in your car. You have this value for, you know, this car. You could get this car for it. However... That sounds all good, but there really is a shortage of inventory in the market right now due to COVID-19 still. So you trade it in and get the money in your hands, but you don't really have anything to buy at some of these dealers. But at Mohawk Honda, not only do they give you that top dollar for your trade-in, they also have lots of inventory from you to, for you to choose from. They have the largest inventory, in fact, of vehicles in the entire capital region. And that means you can choose the one that's right for you. And that's really what's the most important thing, right? Some other dealers talk about their values, but at Mohawk Honda, they'd rather really show you theirs with value in selection and more importantly, the value in how you're treated at Mohawk Honda. Like I said, I go in for an oil change. I, my car, <laughs> it's hot out. Like I said, I needed my mm. AC rejuvenated. I don't even know how you put it. I'm not really a car guy, but they, <laughs> they needed to put more air, more fuel. More AC juice. More, more <laughs> juice. Give me the juice. But they, they were really great about it. Quick and easy, 10 minutes, in and out, boom, I'm on my way. Don't feel pressured into buying something from another dealer because that's the best they can do and just settle. Go to Mohawk Honda and buy the vehicle you deserve. Their vast selection of certified pre-owned vehicles is guaranteed to fit your needs, your lifestyle, and not the other dealer's values. This summer selection is keen and no one has more to choose from than Mohawk Honda, where they always go out of their way to please you. And to keep it on the summer theme, baseball. Uh, we talked about you know the MLB foreign substance rule going into place last week mm-hmm. on our show. And this first week has been a doozy. Uh, First impressions are not great. Um, It's been quite theatrical, really. And Rob Manfred is just continues to ruin baseball in every single way. But that's for an episode where we don't have much to talk about. Um, Among the highlights, uh, let me see here. Uh, Max Scherzer, future Hall of Famer was quite animated and ple- less pleased, I should say, about being inspected for the sticky stuff mm-hmm. by umpires uh, on a third occasion in the middle of the inning because obviously after every inning you get checked, no matter what. Uh, Joe Girardi called him out and, you know, he he went down and, you know, threw his hat down, you know, threw his belt down, did this, and it was a whole theatrical event, took more time, took about 10 minutes to sort out. Um on the same evening, a few hours later, <laughs> out in Oakland, <laughs> Sergio Romo uh, probably had my favorite reaction, <laughs> displayed his uh, less than pleased feelings about the whole thing when the umpire simply came over to inspect his glove. Romo threw his hat down. I'll, I'm going to take my headphones off. He threw the hat down like so, <laughs> threw it, untucked his shirt, pretty much unbuttoned his pants, threw his glove down, unbuttoned his pants, threw the belt down, and pretty much gave all the city of Oakland a show. <laughs> um, it's been a mess. And we've actually had our first pitcher 
suspended. Mariners left-hander Hector Santiago was ejected from a game Tuesday afternoon or Monday evening. Tuesday afternoon was suspended 10 games by the MLB because he had sweat and rosin mixed on the ball. So he says in his words, Uh, but he is the poster child as the first player to be suspended to this new rule. Thoughts, comments on the first week of what has been a shit show to put it nicely (laughs) of the MLB's foreign substance rule. Uh, I mean, it has to be, they have to have a better system. I'd say for it's doing been it. bad. They enter. Look, and, and I hate to cut you off. I'll, I'll let you go. Talk. They even, they even stopped the, the Phillies got crushed Monday night by the Reds 12 to four. So bad to the point where Nick Maton, who's a bench second player or second baseman, I should say for the Phillies pitched the ninth inning or pitched the eighth inning. They inspected Nick Maton's glove and hat as if he went out there with spider <laughs> tack to improve his velocity <laughs> and yeah, spin no. rate. I mean, come I mean, on, man. I mean, like, it, it's, it's brutal. brutal. Yeah. It, I mean, there has to be a system. Um, you know, if they're checking at the top, like every, every inning or when a new pitcher comes in, that's one thing, but to be doing it like, you know, mid inning, multiple times when uh, the other manager is requesting it. I mean, come on now. I mean, obviously another manager might just request it to throw them off their game, to piss them off and to get inside their head. So it's like, at what point are you going to like, just legislate it to a a fact of where you're not doing it like all the time and slowing the game down? Because that was another problem that the MLB has faced in the past and several years where you know, slowing the game down. They're trying to speed it up. They added the pitch count. They added the pitch clock. Oh, my cat's back there. Um, <laughs> cat made an appearance now. We <laughs> yeah, had Otis. Is, now we have Cat. This is Taliza. She's very cute. But, um, yeah, so, like, there has to be some type of, like, to a point you can't check them every time, all the time. You're just slowing down the game, and you're pissing the, the you know, the uh, pitchers off, obviously. Like, they're they're – making a public display at this point and they're just making a mockery of the the whole mlb as a whole so at this point i don't even know like are you doing more harm than good at this point and and to the effectiveness of the actual game um i think the they they put out the, the stats on on spin um for pitchers has gone significantly down and so it is having the effect of where those pitchers who are using it, who were using it before, are not having as much control as they would like, which I guess is what you wanted. Well, in a to way, your, to your point, uh, you know, Garrett Cole has been brutal since the role has been in place. Another guy, Garrett Richards, has been basically lo- I mean, he doesn't even look like he knows how to pitch anymore in two starts. He's been absolutely brutal. His ERA is over nine. Uh, Before his first start, since the rule got put into place, he said he has to figure out basically, and I quote, a completely different way to pitch because he cannot get the proper grip on a baseball to spin it like he used to. So whether or not you really feel pity for Richards, because it's cheating, but he embodies like, the problem that was in the MLB when it came to pitching, he embodies the effect of making such a drastic change, getting so really aggressive and implementing a rule that really was ignored until the middle of the season. Like that's, that's like, if there's clearly a problem, that's one thing and you need to address it, but you don't tell a smoker to stop smoking entirely and go cold <laughs> turkey you yeah. slowly ease it in yeah so uh, i mean that's the best way i can compare it um to put it into another perspective the league-wide batting average was down to 232 in april mm-hmm. we're back up to 244 heading into Ju- into july so clearly i mean mm-hmm. obviously some of that has to do with weather you know the ball flies yeah. when it's warm but isn't it just a little bit of a coincidence that, you know, pitchers can't use their spider tech and uh, other foreign substances. And all of a sudden balls are flying out of the yard and you're seeing 12, four and, 
you know, yeah. eight, you uh, know, Garrett Cole, who seems to be unstoppable, is now giving up, you know, five runs in inning, and <clears throat> Jacob Degrom gives up two runs. Now, now, look, Jacob Degrom still Jacob Degrom, but Jacob Degrom is now giving up multiple runs for the first time all year. It's just, it, it makes you think, but it's also been maddeningly frustrating to watch. Yeah, uh, tracing like the spin, the spin rate of balls is is not like an exact science because, like you said, it weather influences a lot of it. Um, so it's not exactly straightforward. Um, but I think it it is evident that eliminating all the the sticky crap that the the pitchers have been using is an effective tool um, for lowering the aggregate spin rate and like significantly and if that's what the uh, the mlb wanted which it seems to be that's what i want they wanted they wanted to eliminate this cheating i say quote unquote cheating because it was one of those you know another unspoken rule kind of in the mlb where it's like yeah it's technically cheating but since everyone does it it's kind of okay for the pitchers anyway so it's an even playing field for the pitchers not an even playing field for the batters and that was you know, affecting the game in that they want to have more high scoring games and they don't want hitters as a whole hitting 230 or whatever. Well, which, uh, it's that you said in the beginning. It was, it was down to two, April. April, we were down to 232. We started off yeah. really low. Obviously, we had all those no hitters. We, we are yeah. like one of our first episodes we were talking about. All the I think it was hitters. our first one. Yeah. And now we're up to 244, which is still low, but. But significantly Look, higher. Well, I, players significantly. It was well, higher. Let's be real about this. Players have been cheating in baseball since before the 1900s. I mean, you could go back to the Baltimore Orioles back in the 1890s, where they would trip opponents as they ran the bases or cut in front of second base, going from first to third. Mm-hmm. Pitchers will adapt, and they're going to try to find a harder detected, harder to detect advantage. So. Really? The, if, the, look, look, and, and here's the thing, and I'll let you finish in a sec. Like, if batters suddenly start hitting like near 300 again, and you know teams are averaging six, seven runs a game, then we're gonna go back to where we were see, at the beginning of the year, and like, oh well, the ball is the ball juice. We're hitting too many runs. How can we help the pitchers out? It's the back and forth with baseball that is madly frustrating, and it, it's been it's been like this ever since Rob Manfred became commissioner of the league. He is and ruining baseball in every single way. And it's just, it, it's, there's, I, I, there's we so, can have a whole episode about how Rob Manfred is a shithead and ruining baseball. <laughs> They're so ridiculously reactive is the thing. That's, that's yes. what you're de- res- yes. describing. And it's just like, you're never proactive. You're never thinking about this stuff. Like in the off season, it's always like mid season when people are crying about it. That's when you decide to change it. And, I think we touched on this a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week when we talked about the substance ban going into effect, how it's just kind of like out of the blue middle of the season. We're doing this right now. And to uh, the player, I forget the player you were, you were quoting earlier when he was saying that he has to figure out Oh, Garrett Richards. Yeah. Yeah. The whole new way to pitch. You'd think that it would be a little bit smarter maybe to do this in the off season so that pitchers have time to learn that well, new way to pitch. And, and the best way, like I said, I could put it, you don't tell a smoker to just stop. Exactly. You, exactly. You, you don't go cold Turkey and you, you don't see the slow. NBA. It like doing the, the, the their whole rule change. They're, they're going to talk about it over the summer in the off season. They don't do it in the middle of the goddamn season. I know it's the playoffs. So maybe in the regular seat, they still, the, the NBA would never do that in the middle of a season. The NFL would never do that in the middle of a season. I think, I mean, the NFL kind of is reactive as well, but, um, but they, you but, know, but the thing is the, the NFL is better at adapting and mm-hmm. changing like yeah. if they go to an extreme, they'll reel it back and admit their mistake. Where the MLB is like, no, this is the way now. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, you know, we're we're gonna change this, and and everybody has to abide by it. That's just the way it is. No, like what's the old saying? What like the NBA does it first, the NFL does it best, and the MLB is always just behind. And like that's just yep. that's just how it goes. And uh, MLB has a has a they have a problem and they don't know how to go about fixing their problems in a non reactive and just like out of the blue kind of way. Um, I don't know. They need to get better because you're right at this point, at some point, you know, 
it's going to go up to where hitters are hitting 300 on average and or more. And then, you know, home runs are off the charts and then they're going to pull it back the other way. And it's just going to be a, a tug, of, a, you know, game of tug of war until finally they just, you know, people lose interest in the MLB because they're checking for sticky stuff every two innings, every half inning, every batter. And yeah, it's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. It makes it makes the game almost unwatchable at times. And if you're a fan of one of these teams with where these guys like pull their pants down and just throwing their arms up in the air because they don't they're they're just sick of it. And it's 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 disheartening to watch, I'd say as a whole. It's 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 been tough and and look, I've I've had conversations with a bunch of friends who are one of my good buddies, die hard Yankees fan, die hard baseball fan, loves baseball. Barely watches it. Partially because the Yankees suck, but um <laughs> it's hard and, to watch the Yankees these days. And, and I thought we'd have time to break down the Yankees, but I'll give them another week before we wrote we we put them on blast. Yeah, we're already um, in an hour. So we're already an hour. So I, I lied to uh, I lied to everybody again. Shocker, uh, um, but it, it's yeah. Baseball is getting to the point where it's not the game we grew up to to love and watch. As you know, if you're on our live stream, cat's just chilling in the background. She's really cute. Check she her is, out. She is very cute. I I, mm-hmm. I can only tell because I have all many all these tabs open, but. Uh, I do want to get to one more thing. I don't know if anybody is familiar oh, with Chris Sims. I forgot we didn't even get to this. We didn't even get to this, and we're going to get to it. We haven't really talked much football, so I wanted to throw this in because Chris Sims came out with a top 40 quarterback countdown. And for the most part, like I get some of the arguments. And... This isn't really even an Eagles angle. I mean, it is because it's an Eagles quarterback, but Jalen Hurts was excluded from the NFL top 40 quarterback countdown, according to Chris Sims. Not only is Jalen Hurts not in, not in the list, and you can Google this list. I'll read off the list. Uh, we, we could talk about it a little bit. But not only is Jalen Hurts not in, on the list. Case Keenum lands at 40. Excuse me, what? <laughs> you have players that haven't even taken a snap yet in the NFL ahead of Jalen Hurts. Justin mm-hmm. Fields at 39. Kellen Mond at 37. He's not even a... What? He's not even the starter in, in Minnesota. He's a backup. <laughs> He's projected to be a backup. <laughs> you have... Tyrod Taylor, Marcus Mariota, Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater, Jared Goff, Mac Taysom Jones. Hill. Taysom, Taysom Hill is not even a quarterback. He's a gadget Jason, player. Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston. Daniel Jones. I'm sorry. I look, I, I'm very hard on Daniel Jones. I don't think he's a very good quarterback, but I <laughs> guess I, I understand. Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know, okay, whatever. But to not to have these guys on the list period and not have Jalen hurts who look went one and three as a starter. I get that, but showed spurts showed signs. Like he's a comparable quarterback and has looked good on any, like he's embracing the starting quarterback role. Like, look, I'm not the one uh, as our listeners know, I am not a fan of Jalen hurts. I am not. And I will be the first one to admit that and admit that I'm wrong. If he proves me wrong, that the Eagles made the biggest mistake in franchise history by trading one Carson Wentz to the Colts, who lands at 18, by the way, behind some Hello. questionable players as well. <clears throat> um, too low, in my opinion. But I get it off the season that he had. I, mm-hmm. I, I at least mm-hmm. get it. However, I, I'm i sorry, but that's just, that's just asinine to me. <clears throat> All right, yeah, I mean... You know, Sims is more of a QB analyst than I am, for sure. I'll admit that, obviously. I'm just a guy. <laughs> but you d- you do have to wonder about some of these. I mean, I, I-, I have problems read- with the list top to bottom, even. Like, I mean, Josh Allen is very good. I don't think he's number two, which is where he has he's him. He's not the... So, let, I'll read... 
top 20. You want me to read off top 20? Yeah, go, go for it. Go for it. Patrick Mahomes at one. Josh yep. Allen is two. Aaron Rodgers, three. Deshaun Watson, four. Russell Wilson, five. Lamar Jackson, six. Kyler Murray, seven. Matthew Stafford, eight. Dak Prescott, nine. Tom Brady, te- the, the GOAT. Tom Brady at 10. Off a Super Bowl. but Off a Super know. Bowl victory. <laughs> Justin Herbert, 11. Ryan Tannehill is 12. Uh, <laughs> okay. Baker Mayfield's 13. Derek Carr is f- is 14. Matt Ryan, 15. Kirk Cousins, 16. Joe Burrow, 17. Carson is 18. Sam Darnold is 19. Cam mm-hmm. is 20. Yeah. Uh, I mean... <laughs> The, uh, hell, uh, I don't like Tom get Brady, it. like like let's look at Tom Brady. I I understand that. The Tom only Brady thing I is, agree with is Patrick Mahomes at one. I do uh, for sure agree with that one. That I, I think his top five is pretty good. I would have them in a slightly different order. Um, I would probably have Mahomes, then probably Rogers, then Allen, uh, then Russell Wilson, then Deshaun. That would be my top five. So I, I have his top five just in a different order, and then. Tom Brady, I know he's he's like 42 and he ha- has no athletic ability to run outside the pocket, really. But the d- d- the man just won a Super Bowl. You got to get like and cerebral. we got we got Matthew Stafford and Dak Prescott ahead of him. Yeah, I mean, like what are his, we doing here? His athletic ability may not be there, but his mental ability is better than almost everyone here. Tom so Brady just like, took a seven and eight foot or. Eight and eight football team, seven and nine football team, and took them and won the Super Bowl. That's yeah, what he I did. Mean, I mean, I I think he should definitely be above Matt Stafford and probably Dak Prescott, but I get why Dak Prescott is up there. Um, Dak and, but Prescott Dak Prescott is coming off an injury. Dak Prescott gets the numbers because Dallas doesn't have defense and they have no choice but to throw 40 times a game. Like, what are we doing here? Let's, it's let's no football. Like, look, I'm not a quarterback. I, but I know football, and I'm willing to call you out in your shit when you have a Super Bowl goat behind Dak Prescott and Matthew Stafford, who have a combined zero playoff wins. And then the other thing that I have Tyler's a problem ahead with, of Tom Brady. On what the other side, I, I know that Sims, you know, he looks at the at the college quarterbacks and whatnot, but there is such a difference coming from college yeah, to the pros. The, the, I don't understand. How can you have people the, who haven't played a snap the second, above people? The, the like, second half the second half is littered with all these rookies that haven't played a snap in the NFL, and you're going to tell me they're better than Jalen Hurts? Like Mac How Jones do you know? 30. How do Mac you know Jones that? At, Mac Jones at 30, and like – I mean, the people like Jared Goff, I think, would have something to say about Mac Jones being rated ahead of him. Taylor. And Jared Goff has been to a Super Bowl. Taylor, if, I, if I'm if i an NFL GM or I'm sitting there and asking any NFL GM, any, any, any 32, maybe besides the Texans because God knows what they're doing, who's better, Case Keenum or Jalen Hurts? Who would you rather build a team around, Case Keenum or Jalen Hurts? Am I, I mean, going to get one Case Keenum answer? Probably not. I I would hope not. If 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 I, I mean, do, I, big, I I would be concerned about the future of your franchise. Jalen Hurts hasn't had a big sample size, but I'd still take his upside over Case Keenum because we've seen what Case Keenum can do at max, and it's not much. It's not a lot. He can't. I mean, he sure, he played in the NFC playoffs. Championship game, but that's because of the Vikings defense. And a, yeah. and a prayer to Stefan Diggs. Yeah, exactly. And and so, like, it, and Kellen Mond, that, that one's funny, too. That's kind of, <laughs> Kellen, how is, Ke, how is Kellen Mond 37? How how do you have Kellen Mond ahead of Trey Lance? Just, I mean, there's, I have a lot of questions. I have many questions. So the only two I think that I can see that are uh, the starter and backup are Kirk Cousins and Kellen Mond, and then Taysom Hill and Jameis Winston. Taysom Hill and Jameis Winston are 24, 25, right on top of each other, Taysom which is Hill's weird. Taysom Hill's not a quarterback. He's <laughs> not a quarterback. So how do you have him in a top 40 countdown? I don't understand. Jameis Winston is the starter. You went on. Oh, I, I, I muted you. 
Oh no, you muted Taylor. Taylor muted himself. He couldn't even take it anymore. He he muted himself. I pulled out my mic. I I hit the dump button. Got so worked up. Yeah, hit the hit the dump button. <laughs> <laughs> for 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 people that are not familiar with what a dump button is, it's uh, it sounds uh, when, really funny if you don't know what it is. When when, when bad <laughs> things are said on air and, and it's live on air, usually you have a two or three second period before it's actually broadcasted out on your airwaves. In case something bad is said, you can press the dump button. It'll just go black. It'll, it'll just be blank air. It'll just be nothing. It, it, it's not the button you press when you have to go to the bathroom really bad. No, which no. Could have said, which like, you which don't know what happens, it is. which happens on air as well. I got to go hit the dump button right now. <laughs> Man, I, I mean, we talked about Chris Sims list and Ben Simmons. I might have to go to the bathroom <laughs> after this. <laughs> might have to hit that old good old dump button. <laughs> My God. But, oh, um, I, I just I had to we had to talk about this list. It, it's just so bad. It, and and Google it. You all you have to do is Chris Sims top forty quarterback countdown, and it, it it'll pop up. It got wrote. I mean, it took a lot of heat from Philly, obviously, because it didn't have Jalen Hurts. But a lot of people had a lot of question marks about a lot of quarterbacks. Yeah, I do. I have a lot of question. I mean, obviously Carson Wentz, I don't think should be at eighteen, but that's just me. Um, I get it because of the year, think, but he's yes. he's not. He, I, I I'll take put it our, this way: after this season, I think he will not be eighteen next next off. Season. He'll be top ten again. I, I believe it. Yeah, I totally believe I, that. You know, yeah. I think he could push Matthew Stafford out, even Dak Prescott, maybe. I think Matthew or Stafford's Tom Brady. Gonna, if if Tom Brady falls I think, off, the I cliff. think Stafford's going to have a year. Uh, uh, early fantasy rankings Matthew Stafford's a guy to watch I mean for, yeah that's true it, the, the trade he's on a loaded he's Rams a, offense loaded much, Rams much, offense much so, better than Detroit yeah so so watch out for Matthew Stafford I, I really like what he brings to the table come fantasy wise but we'll have plenty of time to talk of uh, a fantasy uh, of course yeah it's America week and coming up is America weekend Independence Day is obviously Sunday any big plans <clears throat> Uh, I think we're gonna have a little shindig, or I'm gonna go to we're gonna go to a friend's Hope the house. I think holds up. We were gonna go on a boat, but I don't think that's the gonna happen. Look, yeah, the weather look. I, look, I'm going camping starting on Friday until Monday. And it's the, supposed to rain for the next five days, possibly. I know we're we're you know it feels like a hundred and you know five degrees out. They say, and you know now we're going from that to seventy and rainy. Surprise, surprise! Welcome to upstate New York. Um, but no, it, I'm just going to be happy to get out, do some fishing. Um, I won't be able to watch Joey chestnut absolutely slay the hot dog challenge again this year. That that has been a Godzilla media tradition for, you know, years mm -hmm. now. Um, I don't know if he got Joey on his podcast this week. I'm not sure. I don't but, think he has, but I think he will. Yeah, I, I think I think he's aiming to get Joey on. I don't know if it's going to be with Levac, um, which I'm very, you know, that that's finally cats out of the bag there that they're back together. So uh, mm -hmm. really happy about that. It's good to get the old band back together. So that'll be fun stuff, man. Uh, it, it's that's classic. Been, it, it's classic. That's vintage. That's vintage yes. media right that's there. Vintage. But no, it's good to have the squad back together. Very that's excited. Very excited to have Levac join Godzilla Media and just really looking forward to hanging out with those guys again. Um, track season, just for a little side note, uh, season tickets are out for Saratoga Track. Uh, they will be at 100% capacity starting opening day. And Whoop. opening day, if you are vaccinated, your entrance is free. So if you are oh, not really? yet vaccinated cool. in this, yeah, if you're not yet vaccinated and you know you really want to go to Saratoga and want some free admission time's ticking. Cause you need that two week uh, period to get your second dose. So just saying, mm -hmm. just saying, or you could get the Johnson Johnson too, I guess that, that's fine. But so no, Bryce, every what's that for, 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 for 4th of July, are you a hamburger guy? Are you a hot dog guy or both? Oh, I'm a, I'm a burger guy. Absolutely. So burger we're going to bring, so obviously if we're fishing, we're hoping the hope is that we catch some dinner you know, mm -hmm. catch something to, to make on the 4th of July, but we are bringing, we're going to bring some steaks. We're going to bring some burgers. I glamp. I don't, I don't camp. I glamp. <laughs> I mean, we are going to be in a tent. Um, we're going to be at Lake Harris up in, up in the Adirondacks, which is like near Lake Placid. So it's going to be cold. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, we're going to, we're going to bring some food, but I'm 
between the conversation of burgers and hot dogs, I'm a burger guy. Hit 10 put, out of 10 times. Put ketchup on it? Um, depends on the mood I'm in. Um, but cheese always. Cheese always. Yeah, of, course, of course. No um, one wants a hamburger. Come on. American or cheddar? Uh, I mean, I love a good pepper jack, actually. I'll throw oh, a look at you. It'll get some spice in your life. Yeah. No, I, I'm. But I'm a, between those two, I'm uh, a base, I'm a basic American, bish. I'm, I'm a basic bish. <laughs> I, I like cheddar and you know American, but I, um, I like them both too. But I, I like some some spice in my life, and I, I, I but I do love a good hot dog. Oh hot yeah, dog for, for the hot, I, I'm sure we'll throw some hot dogs hot dog in. over a fire. Absolute best. Yeah, we have our s'more stuff. We're obviously bringing uh, Otis along, and we we have tarps. We're prepared for the rain. I'm not mentally prepared for the rain, but we are, <laughs> we are prepared for the rain. Um, I heard, I heard the black flies are still an issue up there. So that's a Have fun with that. <laughs> that's a wrinkle. I wasn't really expecting, but no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting out and, and doing things again this year. And, you know, 4th of July, 4th of July is my holiday. I love summer. I'm a big summer person. I, I don't like, like I'll toler. Like I like Chris, like you can't hate Christmas, but, no. It is what it is for me. Like I'm not like lining up like half these psychopaths and like, oh my god, it's Christmas and it's not even Thanksgiving yet. And <laughs> you know, Christmas stuff is out in the in the stores and we're not even past Halloween yet. And I'm you know looking for my costume and, and you know I, I see Rudolph the Red nosed Reindeer on display for you know fifty nine ninety nine for your yard. I'm like, can, can, can we get can we get into November first? But um, I like summer. Fourth of July is my holiday. Just fish. Give me fish. I hate being cold. Give me a fishing rod, a cold six pack of Bud Light, Corona, whatever, a nice cigar, and let's have a weekend. Um, be safe out there. Have a very happy Fourth of July weekend. Whatever you're doing, no matter Drink where you are, responsibly. Drink responsibly. Uh, yeah, uh, there's gonna be plenty of drinking done. Don't worry. <laughs> and if it's gonna be cold between and between the two of us, I'm sure. Between the two of us, between the two of us, uh, here here at Sports with a Z and a T, there will be plenty of drinking done uh, <laughs> but responsibly, um, but responsibly. But of course, always <laughs> responsibly. No, enjoy, be safe, uh, um, have fun, and, and we will be back here next week uh, ta- for Taylor Lattimore. I'm Bryce Zelinsky. This is Sports with a Z and a T podcast brought to you by mohawk honda at saving face barbershop i forgot about saving face barbershop i don't want to forget about our good oh. friend jeremiah up at saratoga springs if don't you need that jeremiah. fresh cut for the fourth of july weekend if you're going out you're going out on that boat you want that fresh cut head up to saratoga he's always got time for you guys i need to go i'm probably not I'm gonna, gonna have make, to go again yeah i'm probably not gonna make it up before the fourth of july but make your way up there he's always gonna make sure you go out there looking your best and ready to tackle the summer bars are opening guys, up track season is approaching saratoga so the bars are opening up you want to look good you can go online and you can you can book your appointment there that's that's how i did it and i yes. think that's the best way to do it. you don't have to, have to call or go and just go online and book your appointment and just be there. And you have the option to have them come to you, obviously. That's true. I, I'm more of the atmosphere kind of guy. He has a great atmosphere up there. The guys are For awesome sure. to talk to. So I would definitely recommend going in. They're fully open. All the COVID restrictions have been lifted. So get yourself in there and get yourself a fresh cut with our boy from Jer- uh, Jeremiah up in Saving Face Barbershop in Saratoga Springs. Uh, like I said before, I, I jumped the gun a little bit. But for Taylor Lattimore, I'm Bryce Linsky. This was Sports with a Z and a T podcast brought to you by Godzilla Media, sponsored by Mohawk Honda and Saving Face Barbershop. Have a very happy 4th of July. We will see you next week. Uh, trust the process. Fly, Eagles, fly. Uh, all, that Philly, all that Philly stuff. Go Heat. Yeah, Go Colts. Have, have a happy 4th. We'll catch you. See ya.